the last speaker at the Labour Party conference was its deputy leader, that rather gobby lady with a dead fox on her head. I don't know who the last speaker at the Conservative Party conference is because I don't know if it's even finished yet. Um, I, probably the international man of mystery James Cleverly or someone like that. What does this tell us? It tells us, friends, that you are in the right party because look who we've got. <laughs> Now, no amount of toadying, groveling, and sycophancy on my part could possibly do justice to our guest, but I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> a year or so back, the industry magazine, Interesting Engineering, <laughs> yes, it's a good one, isn't it, <laughs> devoted a huge amount of editorial space to a scientific explanation regarding the airspeed of a laden and unladen swallow, and concluded that the discussion about this issue in Monty Python's film The Holy Grail was, as it put it, on just about the right lines, assuming that the swallow flies at a speed of nine meters per second. One tiny discussion from a film released almost 50 years ago, and as hilarious now as it was then, is able to provoke a 1,500-word essay in a scientific magazine. And there are so many words, allusions, concepts from the Python team or from Faulty Towers which have become part of our modern vernacular. Dead parrot. Don't mention the war. What have the bloody Romans done for us? <laughs> and, of course, a humorous, if somewhat slighting, reference to our very esteemed colleagues in the People's Front of Judea. <laughs> More relevant still today, perhaps, the incredulity of Reg, when faced with Stan's wish to have the right to be a woman, even though he isn't a woman. Where's the fetus going to gestate? You're going to keep it in a box? John Cleese is incontestably the funniest comedian of the last 70 years as a writer and performer. But he not only changed comedy for good, with The Frost Report, Python, Faulty Towers, The Life of Brian, and so on, he also changed our outlook. Without ever being overtly political, John has always been our most subversive, anti-establishment and political comedian. The dark humour has been directed at the stultifying and pompous conservative establishment of the 70s and 80s, but also at the patent ridiculousness of the far left, at hyper-liberalism and the psychotic behaviour of extremists. And that's the thing. If you're a comedian, it's quite easy to have a go at Margaret Thatcher or Jeremy Corbyn. It's far more difficult and in the end far more resonant and funnier to mock the assumptions and the mindsets which lie behind the support for these politicians. John has also always done that, to hilarious effect, that he could also find time to record a party political broadcast for the SDP Alliance is another reason we should cherish this man, of course. I suppose that we in the SDP are quite possibly, in John's view, fellow travellers of a man called Kevin Phillips Bong, who was a member of the slightly silly party, and who, in losing to Tarquin, Fintim, Limbim, Wimbim, Limbim, Bus Stop, Fatang, Fatang, Ole, Biscuit Barrel, of the silly party, polled a disappointing zero votes. Well, if he thinks that of us, we'll soon find out. Friends, friends, please welcome the incomparable John Cleese. Could have been a bit more complimentary, but so. <laughs> uh, 
I was delighted when William contacted me and said he wanted to chat to me. And he told me about the, uh, this party. And I was so happy because it was like going for a walk and bumping into an old friend who you were quite sure was dead. <laughs> and he asked me to speak here tonight and I thought I'd love to. Um, partly because I look forward to the misinterpretations and misleading uh, headlines, as uh, Rod has just suggested. I imagine there'll be lots of jokes about dead parrots and uh, dead ex-comedians joining ex-parties, but it's lovely to be here. The only alarming thing is that this is, uh, discussion is far too sophisticated. I mean, almost everything that's been said is interesting and would have gone down very badly at any of the other party conferences. It was all much too thoughtful. <laughs> so if my little uh, contribution seems a bit uh, naive, that will be because I didn't realize well, what a nice lot of people you are. <laughs> yes. What I loved was a comment somebody just made to me saying, what I like about this party is this is not the sort of people you expect to see at party conferences. <laughs> you know? I think that's a great compliment to everyone. Anyway, I ought to tell you, uh, the reason I am here is that I have for a long time now really been appalled by the corruption lying sleaze and good old-fashioned ineptitude of the last three Tory administrations. And I do believe that our first priority is quite simply to throw them out. And I will... <laughs> I will happily help uh, anyone who is going to do that, uh, including, but not necessarily exclusively, uh, the SDP. Because I have quite a, quite a history with you guys. I mean, I'm 83 this month. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes it gets a round of applause. It's rather condescending <laughs> when people clap because you're still breathing. <laughs> but I remember all that stuff in 1981 very, very clearly. And uh, particularly um, the conference when Dennis Healy was elected leader by half a percentage over Wedgwood Ben, and how the far left then really took the party over and came up with the most extraordinary list of resolutions as a result of which the Gang of Four went off, and I was um, delighted to go with them. I, I felt a real, real hope. Um, and then David Owen asked me if I would uh, do an entire 10-minute party political broadcast for him, on proportional representation. Um, and I remember doing the research on that and discovering to my delight that the only other country in Western Europe that did not have PR was the Vatican City. <laughs> <laughs> and then he asked me to do another, and then I did uh, two more for dear Paddy Ashdown, all on the subject of uh, proportional representation. Uh, which was always opposed by the right, uh, especially by the right with newspapers and girls on the grounds that it led to weak <laughs> coalition governments, <laughs> you know, like those in Germany, the Netherlands, Finland, Belgium, Switzerland, <laughs> France, Austria, and so forth. <laughs> In fact, the only halfway decent country, uh, government we've had recently was a coalition government. You know, it was not bad at all. I mean, Cameron and Click. But do you remember what happened? That at the next election, the uh, Tories pursued a, a, a policy of what they called decapitation, which was running very hard against any of the other people that they'd just been in coalition with. Um, and uh, because, of course, the, the uh, Tory party does not like to share power. And it's not just ordinary um, common old garden Oxford arrogance. It's, it's more than that. It's the, uh, the realization that uh, being in a coalition makes a corruption much more difficult, much more difficult to hide. And I'm not just talking about selling peerages and paying off donors with uh, lucrative COVID contracts. I'm talking about the disgraceful arrangement in recent years between Number 10 and the right-wing press, described in detail 
in Peter Oborn's astounding book, The Assault on Truth, <clears throat> a book ignored, of course, by the press, who will no longer employ Mr. Oborn on Fleet Street. That's the way the press works, you see. And I don't think people, I mean, we know the press is awful. I don't think people realize quite how bad it is. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but there is an organization called the European Broadcasting Union. And every year they do a poll. They go to every European country and ask uh, a thousand people in that country whether they trust the printed media. And for the last 15 years, Britain has been last on all but one occasion when it was last but one. Now, I don't know how many of you know that this very sensible poll says that we have the least trustworthy press in Western Europe. Did many of you know that? I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps it's not in the papers, and that's what happens. They can hush things up, you know? Oh, extraordinary. But it's not really surprising with that sort of cynicism when the, the owners of these papers are offshore billionaires of insatiable greediness and uh, the Mail and the Telegraph are really uh, just house magazines for the, the um, Tory party now. And what, what, what a, a proper democracy wants from its newspapers is honesty and, and accuracy and fairness. Yeah. It's not asking that much. We frail, frail human beings need criticism if we're going to um, improve at anything. You know, when uh, the great sports stars hire coaches, um, those coaches don't tell them how wonderful they are the whole time. You know, it's a process of constructive criticism and um, identifying weaknesses and then practice on the weaknesses, you see, which all requires a friendlier, helpful, critical attitude towards them, which is not something we get from our press. Uh, despite the fact the press uh, criticizes everyone else, you know, football managers, entrepreneurs, politicians, authors, films, restaurants, fashion, they cannot abide criticism of themselves because they, they regard it as a kind of les majesté. Um, and, and because of that, they never get any better. Because people who look at themselves and criticize themselves and make improvements where they're weak, get better. These people don't. So, uh, one final plea, because I'm the only thing separating you from a nice drink, <laughs> is could people stop pretending to be certain about things that they can't possibly be certain about, you know? Read the research of um, Philip Tetlock at the University of Philadelphia, Dan Gardner at the University of Ottawa, and they show beyond any possibility of doubt that we are all terrible at forecasting the future. I mean, really terrible. These, these guys did research on 300, not people like us, but 300 pundits, people who make their living about forecasting what's going to happen in major newspapers, and they discovered they were terrible too that these pundits, the people who made their living forecasting, were actually no better than anyone who read a good paper every day. So uh, when people get very, very sure of themselves, I think they should know about this kind of research because um, we don't read about that in the press, of course, particularly in the uh, columns written by pundits. Um, but there are huge limits to our certainty about things. and. Uh, it's a good idea to change our minds about things just, just now and again. So to sum up, we need, one, a serious crackdown on corruption. Two, PR, to reduce the power of extremists by making government policy decided by MPs representing more than half the population. And then legislation based on Leveson to forcing papers to correct their untruths with statements of equal size and prominence as the original untruths. So thank you very much. I feel very happy um, and comfortable with you lot. Thank you.